Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Michael Lonsborough. I'm the host for this evening. And on behalf of the Czech centres in London, it's my great privilege to welcome you here at the, the latest uh, AI Science Cafe. Now, this series was begun early this year by Czech centres in London in collaboration with the Royal Institution. And it, it has covered various AI topics uh, from personal and cyber security, robotics, autonomous mobility, and conversational AI. Today's presentation is all about robotic movements, and in particular, robotic movements in changing environments. Now, because of the ongoing restrictions in travel between the UK and the Czech Republic, we're live streaming this event from Czech uh, Technical University here in Prague. And because of the COVID situation here in Prague, we're actually having a three-centred affair because my guest this evening is at home and he's via Zoom, he's joining with me. So we're doing a sort of a, a three-way communication here. So bear with us. Right, well, let us begin. Uh, since ancient Greek mythology and the story of Pygmalion, that's a, the sculptor, the famous sculptor who fell in love with the uh, statue that he had created, there's existed a, a human desire to, to bring to life the inorganic material around us. Now, Karol Čapek, the uh, Czech writer, crystallized this thought with the invention of the name robot. And today, many of us have either met with or spoken to or, or been with a, a robot of some kind. Indeed, many of us have a robot at home. And I have one. It's a small little thing that's doing the vacuum cleaning very quietly as I speak. Robotics has spread and is spreading into our, the vehicles we drive, into the manufacturing of all the, the products that, we, that we, we consume, and is also coming into our personal lives. Dr. Tomasz Krajnik, who's our uh, guest this evening, is an associate professor at the Department of Computational Science at Prague. Technical University, where he's a member of the Center of Robotic and Autonomous Systems. His PhD was in large-scale mobile robot navigation and map building. And after his post, after his PhD here in Prague, he then actually did a postdoctoral stay in England at Lincoln University, working on the project Strands, which is also to do with spatial temporal robotic movements. Today, we shall talk with Dr. Krajnik about the science of robotic movement and how his work is enabling robots to adapt to changing spatial environments. That's the key term here. Now, what's going to follow is there's going to be a presentation from Dr. Krynik where he'll be speaking uninterrupted for about 20 minutes, following which he and I will have a, a discussion about what he talks about in his, in his um, presentation. And then there'll be 20 minutes towards the end for an opportunity for you to send me questions that I can ask uh, Dr. Krynik here and now, and you can hear the answers directly. So that's the format, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Krynik for his presentation. So, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. And uh, my name is Tom, and I'm going to present uh, some of our works that on robots adapting to the changing environments and how the robots uh, should deal and understand with time because there is no change without time and there is no time without the change. So let me share my screen and proceed with the presentation. So I hope that uh, you can see the, the slides that I've prepared for this presentation. Right? Yep. And let me continue. So as Michael, as Michael mentioned, nowadays robots can do a variety of, of tasks and they are gradually more and more deployed outside of the industrial environments. However, uh, despite of the, of the advances in robotics, we don't see actually many intelligent robots being deployed in, in public locations. And one of the reasons that we don't see robots operating uh, in, in, in common environments is that they sort of lack the robustness to operate for uh, for a long time. So one of the key things that, robo that was investigated in robotics is the art of self-localization and mapping. 
Because one of the key capabilities of a mobile robot when it's deployed in a new environment is to determine its position very, very precisely and, it, and it's to know what is actually happening around it. And so for the last 20 years, the researchers have been working on, uh, on algorithms and methods that allow the robots to create precise and large and detailed maps of their surrounding. So nowadays, when you have a robot moving through a, through a given environment, be it a road for an autonomous car, or be it a surveillance robot that's supposed to map, for example, abandoned mines, etc., or performing a search and rescue operation, as the robot moves through the environment, it uses its sensors to create a representation of its surrounding. And the last 20 years of research on, the, on these robotic mapping technologies materialized in the ability of robots to create centimeter accuracy maps of very, very large kilometer square areas. However, thinking about, about a map that's very precise and very large, etc., there is one thing that it's actually lacking. So once the robot creates a map of the environment, then it can plan its uh, trajectories, it can plan its movement, and it can determine its position. However, the environment is not static. So here is, you can actually see an example of such a three-dimensional map created by drones. One, but one problem of this map is that after a few hours, the map is going to look like this. And if the robot is using visual sensors to navigate around, it won't be actually able to utilize this map uh, at all. And it would have to perform all the mapping that has to be typically assisted by humans. It will have to perform all this mapping all over again. And once the, once the night changes to day, again, the map needs to be updated. So this is kind of a problem that I'm going to talk about today. And this is the problem of the environment change. So what you can see here is another example it's on a, large, on a longer time scale uh, how the environment change can actually affect what the robot sees. So this is a, a place in Stromovka in Czech Arboretum in Prague. And you can see that there, are, there is an image of the same scene. However, it appears visually very, very different. And currently, there are not many algorithms that allow the robots to understand that it's actually looking at the same scene. So during the last... 10 years, the researchers have been trying to tackle this problem of the environment change, and there were several approaches uh, that address this problem. So many of these approaches are actually uh, mentioned in the paper by Lars Kunze from the University of Oxford that you can see here. And basically, when one would summarize this, these approaches, one would find out that there are, let's say, three principal approaches to the problem. The first one, is that you simply ignore the change as you know that you can influence the environment in a way that the change is not going to be prominent. So these are the cases where you actually control the environment. For example, it's a, it's a factory or it's, a, it's some uh, industrial environment where you can control lighting and you can control every changes and, and you can make sure that the change is not prominent to confuse the robots. The other possibility is to try to search for the changes and filter them out. So what your map contains is only the stuff that doesn't change over time. So again, this has been tried many, many times. However, the problem is that some of the environments over time can change completely. So the example that I have here on the pictures, there is very, very little that's actually common to these uh, two images. So for example, you can understand the, the structure of the trees but visually, they appear very, very different. So, so to find something invariant to the change is, is quite difficult. So in the strength project that I was working in for in England, uh, we were trying to treat the changes as source of information. Because one of the things is that once, the, once you have created your map, uh, then every consecutive walkthrough through that map actually means that you don't get any new information except for, except for the stuff that changed. So in our approach in the strengths project, we would say, okay, we want to have a robot that's able to operate for a long time. And that, mean, that means it will be observing the changes around. And once you, 
have the capability to observe the changes over time, then you should be able to create some models that actually explicitly model the change. And the point is that if you are able to reason about the changes that are going to happen, you can actually forecast how the environment is going to look like or what is going to happen in the environment in the future. You will be able to extract the changes for information and use this information uh, for, for prediction or for forecasting. And once you are able to actually forecast what's going to happen, you are able to forecast uh, that it's going to get darker, you are going to forecast which doors are going to be open, when there will be people where, etc. This will allow your robot to operate more efficiently and more robustly, achieving longer times of autonomous operations, meaning that you also are able to observe more and more changes. So through explicit modeling of the changes, uh, robots should be able to actually achieve longer term operation. So the core idea of the research that we did in England was uh, basically as follows. So if you look at the classic robotic literature nowadays, uh, and you open a book that's called Probabilistic Robots, and this is sort of like a Bible for robotics. Uh, in this book, you'll find out that one of the key things to handle in robotics is the notion of uncertainty. So the information that the robot gets is never, never certain because the sensors provide you with very, uh, with information that's not really accurate. So you somehow need to integrate the, the sensor information into an environment model. And in this book, you'll find out that to represent the uncertainty, you would use the notion of probability. So in this book, you'll actually see that there are plenty of models that the robot can, be, can use. For example, an occupancy grid, which tells you uh, which areas of the environment are occupied and which areas of the environment are free, or topological map, which will tell you uh, which way, which corridors you need to take in order to get to a certain location, on, or landmark maps, which are going to tell you which objects you'll be able to see from your sensors in order to determine your position. And uncertainty about all of these elements in the environment is modeled by the probability. And when the robot looks at the, at the object, and when it looks at the particular environment, it can gradually update the probability of these uh, environmental elements and assign a given probability of them. So you can actually reason what's the probability that you will see a certain landmark, you can reason about the probability that a given door is open, et cetera, et cetera. However, in the book, the mathematical foundations that are given there, they have one very, very strong limitation. And this limitation is that the probability is a constant, which actually means that the underlying mathematics that's, that's used in mobile robotics is that the environment is static, and the only uncertainty that comes to your system is through the uh, inefficiency of the sensors. And this actually means that all of these environment models uh, neglect time by principle. So in our research, we said, OK, if you want to model time, you have to say that this probability is actually a function of time. And we assume that many, many of the processes that go on in everyday environment, in everyday environments, exhibit some periodical properties. So we actually decided to say, OK, uh, let's not model the probability as a constant, but let's model it as a combination of sine functions, of, of waves that somehow capture the influence and the periodicity of the, of the environmental changes, uh, which are governed by some periodic properties. So let me explain briefly how this actually works. So imagine that you have a robot that observes a human for, for, a, for a week. And this robot can observe and determine if the human is present or the, if the human is absent. So what you actually get is this binary function of time that tells you that a person is uh, present or that a per person is absent. So typically, uh, the robotic algorithms would basically average this probability out. And they would tell you, OK, this person is present, let's say, 25% of the time. And this was considered to be satisfactory because the robot would be correct in 75% of the time by simply assuming that the person is not there. So in our approach, what we do is that we run something that's called a 
Fourier transform, which is a very popular tool in engineering. And this allows us to extract some prominent periodicities of what, of what we have processed, of what we have perceived. So this binary function is processed by the Fourier transform, and what we get is something that's called a frequency spectrum. And this frequency spectrum tells us about periodicity of the changes of this function. So what we do is that we extract the first uh, component, and this first component corresponds to the original stationary probability. And as I said, this, is, this was already considered a, a pretty good model. The point is that once you include another spectral component, then this spectral component in this case will tell you that there is something that goes on a daily basis. And what you get is this sine wave that tells you it's much more likely that the person will be present during the afternoon than during the morning. And as you include more and more periodicities and more and more spectral components, you will actually get a probabilistic model that you can see in, he in green here that tells you it's much more likely that the person will be present there during the afternoon uh, during the actual weekdays. And it's much less likely that the person will be present at night or during the weekends. So one of the key points of this, uh, of this tool is that if you look at the equation, you can substitute any kind of time inside. And this actually allows you to make long-term forecasts of when the person is going to be present. The other advantage of this model is that you have compressed a lot of observations into a model that contains only a few numbers. So for each of these uh, periodicity representations, we have three numbers, the influence, the frequency, and something that's called a phase shift. Uh, so, and these three numbers efficiently capture one of the environment processes that actually governs the presence of the person in this case. So this is, in brief, the, the principle of the method. So now I will show uh, a video of how it actually was used in the Lincoln University. So one of the things here is that we let a robot run in the offices of uh, Lincoln Center for Autonomous Systems and we let the robot monitor eight different locations, and we let the robot de determine when it is where. So the robot would take this tour every 10 minutes, and it would make this uh, for one week. So then we would take all of the gathered images, and we would extract something that's called the visual landmarks that help the robot to determine where it is. And each of these landmarks was associated with this uh, frequency-based model. So after this week of training, we would actually take the robot and we would place it there one month later and we would ask, ask it, where are you? And so the robot, what it would do, it would say, okay, let me estimate what's the likelihood that I will see these particular landmarks at this particular time and place. And it would create the most likely map for a particular time. And then it would match this map to, an, to what it actually observes. And by doing this, we significantly boosted the ability of the robot to correctly determine where it actually is, because it would use the most relevant map for a particular time to determine its own location. So this was done in the offices uh, of uh, the University of Lincoln. And later on, we repeated this experiment also in Stromovka, where we had robot running for a year, uh, approximately every 14 days or every month. So again, we extracted these periodicities of the appearance of, of given landmarks one year later, and we would check how this influenced the robot ability to, deter to determine on which location it actually is. And again, you can see that the robot was able to extract the seasonal changes, create a map that's, uh, that captures how the environment changes in, let's say, year-long horizons, and use this uh, to its uh, advantage. So this is one of the things that uh, it actually helped the robot operate in, in longer term by making a forecast of how the environment is going to look like uh, at a particular time. So uh, another example that I'm going to show you is the so-called four-dimensional or three-dimensional occupancy grid. So what I can see here, and perhaps what you can also grasp from, from this uh, 3D representations. So this is a 3D representation of the office that I was showing before. So you can see these cubes, and these cubes represent places that are occupied by some objects. 
and the free space is uh, actually free space. And you can see here that the robot created this four-dimensional map that allows you to make a forecast how likely it is that uh, a given location is going to be occupied or not. And what you can see here is uh, people like growing out of their chairs and disappearing at a particular time uh, of the day and appearing again. So the robot would actually understand and it would know uh, how the three-dimensional environment representation would change over time. So this technology actually showed to be showed to be particularly powerful, but it allowed to model very very uh, very limited environmental models. So it actually would require that all the components of the environment that you are model that they have only binary states and that all the models are discrete, at, at, which uh, imposes actually a serious limitations. So we improved this model, we improved this method later on creating something that we call a, a warped hypertime. So this concept actually represents time not by a, not as a linear phenomena, but as a, as a set of uh, as a set of curves that exist in multi-dimensional space, and these curves are closed into themselves, representing the cyclicity of uh, what the robot observes around. So how it works? Let's say that you measure the number of people in a given in a given room. So here, you, what you can see is the timeline what the robot would observe, and you would create first a model that completely neglects the time. So the most best guess that the robot can do about the number of people when it neglects time, it simply average out the the number and to use the average as the as the best prediction. So we would first do it, and then we would run the previous tool over it, extracting the most prominent uh, periodicity in the data. And then what we would do is we would project the time, we would sort of wrap the time, which was originally linear, onto a circle. And what will actually happen that uh, the peak times when, the, when this area was visited and the measurements in these peak times are going to be uh, located on, on actually one time of this new, uh, of this new cyclic space. And the other, the other data, the, the times when this area is not visited that often, are going to exist in, in, another, in another region. So what we can do later on is to run some sort of algorithm that allows, it, allows us to process these data into a probabilistic model. And this will actually allow us to create, uh, to forecast the probability of a given number of people at a given location at a given time by, uh, by using this uh, cyclic representation of time. So we actually tested this, uh, this concept again in, in the University of Lincoln on, on a corridor. And we again, we let a robot to, to stand in a corridor for quite some time. And the robot was just monitoring uh, the people that were going around. So after some time, the robot created a spatial temporal model that allows it to make a long-term forecast of the probability of the presence of people at a given location and at a given time. And this kind of uh, probabilistic map actually allows, is very useful for the robot to plan ahead its activities. For example, imagine a cleaning robot that would be, that is supposed to clean the, uh, the floor. So obviously if the robot is able to forecast when the corridors are full, it can uh, schedule its activity to some other time. So it can schedule the floor cleaning to times which are actually, where, where not many people are going to be around and uh, do some other tasks uh, instead. So this was basically the, the idea of so-called warp hypertime, which represents the time in, as, a non, as a not a linear uh, phenomena, but something that is actually cyclic. So after we finished with the, with the strengths project or when we are about to finish with the strengths project, we also did a couple of, of uh, deployments in, the, in public spaces. So one of the applications that was uh, particularly successful, I would say, was to use uh, the robot as an infoterminal at, at public locations. So typically it works in a way that the, the person who takes care of the public location, be it a, a 
a hospital or a museum, they will tell you a number of locations where they want the robot to provide some information and the robot would have to go there and would have to display some information on its screen and, waiting, and wait for people to interact. What we would do actually is that we would let the robot to decide when to go to which of these locations. So we initially run an experiment in Haus der Barmherzigkeit, which is an elderly care center in Vienna. And we let the robot roam there and visit like, I, I, uh, I think, 15 different locations. So the robot was allowed to operate only during the working hours, so between 9 o'clock and, and 6 p.m. And during four weeks of operation, it was able to gather very, very, very sparse data. So what you can see here is uh, the data that the robot gathered. And you can see here that for some of the locations, you have, for example, I don't know, 10 measurements when the robot was able to get an interaction from a human and when not. And after this uh, four weeks of operation, the robot was create the following model, which allowed it to forecast how likely it is to get uh, interaction at a particular location. So what you can see here is that, for example, near the lifts, the robot was very, very sure that it would get an interaction there because at the lift people are typically bored and they would uh, more likely interact with the robot. There is also one interesting thing, and that if you look at the at the likelihood of interaction at the staff offices, you can see that on Friday uh, there is slightly less chance of getting interaction during the afternoon, which actually revealed the fact that some of the staff are, are leaving earlier for home on Friday. So after discovering this, we were not able to run the robot uh, at this hospital again. <laughs> there is also another another thing, and that's the, the occupancy of cafeteria. And in here, the robot would observe that the cafeteria is uh, is busy during four times of the day. And since it had no observations about how it's going on during the night, it would simply assume that this uh, during the night, the pattern is the same, that people would go there on, let's say, a four hour basis as well. So to correct this, we also uh, managed to convince the, the hospital staff to let the robot run around at night to sort of correct this uh, wrong hypothesis about how people behave. And the robot would actually go to the cafeteria. It would meet the security guard. The security guard would click the, the interface. So the robot would actually confirm, yes, there are people in cafeteria at night. And we were not able to convince it otherwise later on. Uh, another locations where we deployed the robot uh, on a frequent basis is the collection museum in Lincoln, where the robot performs a museum guide. And again, it would be stationed at different locations and provide interesting information. And it will actually use this technology that I'm presenting to decide at which location to wait for interactions and when to recharge its batteries and basically how to schedule its, its activities. Another uh, two locations where the robot is deployed occasionally is the Museum of Natural History in London and the Blenheim Palace, where the robot is deployed by the Oxford Robotics Group. So there are applications of this technology outside of the robotics domain. And actually, since this technology can make forecasts of where people will be present at which time, and uh, since since the, these, these predictions are pretty accurate, we created a tool that allows efficient uh, social distancing. So the idea is that uh, if you want to, or if you need to visit some public location, you can use this tool to uh, tell you when this location is going to be less crowded than, than usual. And this tool works in a way that you have a bunch of uh, volunteers that report to the system how many people are at these public locations. And every night, the system collects this information and creates a spatial temporal map of uh, business of the locations. And then the user of the, of the system can actually select a particular place which he needs or, or wishes to visit. And it, it can ask for a prediction of the business of this place. And then it can actually choose to go to this location when it's not busy, thus avoiding the, the number of interactions and avoiding to, to get infected. 
So this is something that you can actually uh, use as a, one of the outcomes of this trends project. So I guess that that's all for my presentation. What I was trying to show today is that uh, for AI or for robots, when you want to represent the time, the idea is that if you want to represent the time in environments which are occupied by people, you should use human-centric time representations. And the human-centered time, time representations are, are uh, cyclic in nature. They, they somehow resemble a calendar. And the time representations for AI systems that interact with people should not use a, present, uh, a representation that's linear, because linear representations are used for, for physics and for objects, but not for people, actually. So if you are in, more interested about these approaches, you can visit these two web pages, where you can also download the crowd forecasting app that I was presenting. Thank you for your attention. And now I hand over back to, back to Michael. Thank you, thank you, Tomasz. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Well, that was a fascinating um, presentation. And I must admit, as, as, a, as a chemist, when, when listening to these things, I, I'm reminded of sort of when Newtonian physics, which is a very deterministic model, where you know exactly where things are going to be, and you can calculate into the future at any point, once you know the initial um, parameters, you can calculate anything into the future. The, it meets a sort of a, a quantum mechanical effect that we're using to describe electrons. So when you're talking these spatial temporal maps where you can um, have a guess of the probability of finding a human as being the quantum, then it reminded me very much of, of what we do to try and um, you know, analyze and, 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 and predict where you might find or in what state you might find an electron. So is this, is this indeed the case? Do you find a lot of the mathematics you're using, is it, is it sort of like quantum mechanics? Yes, actually the, the mathematics is, is pretty similar. And I agree with you that uh, it very, very much resembles the difference between Newtonian physics, where the world is completely deterministic, uh, and a, a quantum world where uh, there is a lot of uncertainty and until you perform a measurement, you actually cannot say uh, anything for certain. And I think that it actually follows the, the evolution we have seen in robotics. So initially, robots were deployed in environments which are strictly deterministic. So if you imagine the first deployments of robots, these were assembly lines where you could arrange everything and you would know exactly what is going on in your environment. And there was only very, very little space for uncertainty. But once you want the robots to, uh, to be integrated in human societies, you cannot make a very, a very uh, accurate predictions. You cannot treat humans as, as uh, physical objects in this case. So instead of uh, trying to model the world as, as something dead without any will or any, any space for its own decision making, you can actually go for this uh, for this representation that says, okay, nothing is for certain, but there are some patterns that we can forecast and we can use this, these patterns to plan and schedule our activities in a, in a better way. Indeed, so in, uh, in all systems where there's uncertainty there, um, you have, for example, you can say in, in terms of human population that the robots are dealing with humans, then by and large, most humans will be asleep in the night time and active during the day. But however, there's the uncertainty that certain quanta, certain individuals will be up in the night and in bed during the day. And so a robot, therefore, may have a model based on the likelihood, the probabilities, but will always come across uh, unlikely events, sort of uh, which, which all surprises. And so and on these surprise occasions, how do the robots cope with that. So you gave an example of the cleaning robot working in a hospital that can um, form a spatial temporal map of when people are going through certain corridors and should know and be able to predict when they should clean the corridor because there won't be anybody there. However, how does that robot react when there's the unlikely event that all of a sudden there's actually a good number of people there? 
So one of the things is that the robotics technology is, is already mature enough to avoid these people and to uh, not to cause any harm or to, or to operate, to, to keep operating even if there are crowds of people around. However, in these edge cases, which don't happen that often, for example, you can think about, I don't know, occupancy of, of offices during Christmas. Uh, the robot would operate with its normal efficiency as if it would not do these forecasts. So these forecasts are an enabling technology for the robot to get better because it would understand what is going on in the environment. However, they should not cause any harm because in the worst case, the robot would operate as if not performing these kind of uh, these kind of forecasts and, and predictions. And the data being collected by the robot to be able to make these predictions, to, to formulate these maps, is this something that's going to be continually going on forever in the lifetime of that robot? In other words, is it continually uh, improving through iterations every day its model? Yes. So actually, this was some limitation of the original approach that I was presenting the, when we were using the Fourier transform. Uh, the versions of Fourier transforms that are actually very popular in, in, in engineering, they would typically assume that you have this training phase where you create the frequency spectra. And then after some time, you use this frequency spectra for your forecast, but you don't update it. So we actually had to tweak this tool in order for the robot to be able to continuously absorb new data, continuously absorb new experiences, integrate them in the, in the spatial temporal model, and to be able to adapt to some, to some dynamics that it didn't see before and to, to the changes of the dynamics itself. So by doing this, we actually created a, a robot that's uh, continuously updating its knowledge of uh, all the periodic processes that go around of the habits of people of the, and of other periodicities that might actually appear in the environment that were not present there. So it was, a, it was a drive to make a robot uh, a tool that learns perpetually and learns perpetually by learning perpetually, improving its efficiency over time, and also by understanding the habits of people around and by adjusting its activities to these habits, uh, by adjusting its activities to these habits, the robot would like achieve a better integration and better acceptance uh, by, the, by the people who are sharing the environment with it. So that's a clear example of sort of self-teaching from that. So that is a, a certain a definite intelligence where it's, it's iteratively improving its own models that it's creating all the time. And, and that self-improvement, that self-learning. Now, can they also, can individual robots share this information and therefore learn from one another? in the same way as that humans do. I mean, we can, we can read textbooks and, and uh, self-learn and self-educate, but we also, there's a tendency for us to, to go to groups and, and whether it be at universities or schooling and learn from others. Is that a possibility for robots as well? Can they, can they share this big data information? <clears throat> so they, the, the cloud technology nowadays, they, uh, along with the standardization in, in robotics, allow the robots to share the information very efficiently. And of course, this would allow the robots to, to get the information about their surroundings uh, in, a, in a faster way and to adapt to the dynamics in a faster way. By actually, uh, the strength of the approach that I was showing is that it can adapt to a specific environment and it, it can adapt its habits to a specific person it shares the environment with. So sometimes the sharing would make sense because you would get these uh, general patterns across you know, all hospitals or all museums. But when you would a robot deployed in a household, uh, this sharing would not be actually necessary because every household or every, every area with the, where you have a smaller group of people tend to have its own uh, dynamics and the people have their own habits, which might actually differ from the, from the other locations. At the beginning of your uh, talk, you mentioned that uh, despite the fact that robotic technology has been with us for a number of years, perhaps surprisingly, we don't see so many robots 
among us. And uh, so afterwards you explained the, the work that you're doing that's leading towards that possibility. But nevertheless, I, I still have the question that I can see very clearly how your work enables um, robots to effectively self-locate and predict uh, a model of the future where to find things or people or when to do certain tasks. But in terms of being amongst us, in that sort of chaotic um, melee of people, all going in different directions in their own business, doing their own things, completely uninterconnected, under, uninterconnected. Can, the ro can a robot feasibly be able to cope with such a system? So, technically, the robots are really good in, in navigating. They would they can actually navigate in human crowds. But there is one thing that was sort of uh, neglected in the research in the past, and that's the social aspect of the navigation. For example, if uh, 10 years ago you would deploy a robot and you would ask a robot to go around a human, the robot would create the most time efficient trajectory, which means that it would drive against you and centimeters before you, it would change its directions and, and go around uh, by passing you by the shortest path possible. Rather and this is the, the optimal This is optimal from a physics point of view, but it's not very optimal from a social point of view. And again, if I go back to my framework, uh, a robot would actually avoid going against the crowd because it would know, okay, this area, people are typically going in this direction in this particular time. So I'm not going to drive against them because if I do it every day, in the end, people will think that uh, this is not very clever behavior, that I am actually, uh, it would be very awkward for them, and in the end, it would be uncomfortable. Whereas if the robot would avoid these situations and sort of stick with the crowd, and it would uh, adjust its uh, behavior over a long time, this would be understood by people by a sign of intelligence. And there is one thing that we, found out during these long-term deployments, and that's a robot can be stupid when it's deployed on the first time. And it's very, very normal because no one expects anyone to understand everything at, at first go. So if you are in a new environment, you typically do things that are not efficient and then, then might be considered stupid. But people are willing to help the robot, they are going to aid it. But if the robot learns and it shows an improved behavior over time, this is very well accepted. But if you create a system that's good from the beginning, but it's not improving over time, this is going to be perceived in a very, very bad way. Because if a robot performs some mistake and a person helps the robot and the robot repeats the mistake again by using these deterministic algorithms that are based on deterministic representations, this is going to be perceived very bad. So. It's like someone who is repeating the same mistake all over time because he's not learning. And this is really considered as a stupid behavior. And this is one of the limitations in, in acceptance of robots by humans. I mean, uh, that applies for humans as well. I think uh, humans generally show a lot of patience for young children. And they realize they might need to be shown the way, given advice. They're uh, allowed to do, make mistakes. But as they get older and go into adulthood, then the patience shown by the average human will be considerably less. And as you said, if they don't operate to a certain command, then they might think that he's, he or she is stupid. So, so that might suggest that maybe robots need to evolve physically as well, in the sense that they might to be, need to be made to be smaller at the beginning so they can have a, a, a sort of a sympathy from, from humankind to, to allow for mistakes at the beginning until they become fully matured in terms of their uh, AI. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for answering those questions. I, I'm aware of the time, so can we move on, please, to take some questions uh, from our viewers? What is this? So I've got uh, several here, right? From, let's start from the beginning, from uh, uh, Miss uh, Eva Turner. Have you taken into consideration gendered difference in human employment, behavior, and locations? And if not, why not? So we did not do this explicitly. However, uh, the, during the deployment of the project, we embedded some 
some uh, appearance traits in our robot. So it would be clear if the robot was, uh, was a female or if the robot was a male. So for example, the robot running in, in hospital in Vienna, we gave it a small mustache, so uh, everyone would understand that this is, uh, this is a male robot. Whereas for the robot that was actually running in, in Lincoln, uh, we added some, some eyelashes. And we could clearly see that there was a, a different approach of, of people to these robots, that some would, some would be very, for example, confused that the robot uh, uh, is, is using a, a, a non-female voice when it has a female appearance. But in these temporal models, we did not actually address any, any gender differences. But. So that's a gender difference in, in, in the human perception our perception of the, of the sex of the robot, as it were, rather than it being the other way around. I mean, does, do robots distinguish, when they're making such models, do they distinguish between men and women, um, young and old, uh, etc., as, as humans do? So, uh, there is another, actually, line of research that we are likely to, to start uh, next year, and that's trying to, uh, to find and to classify uh, psychological disorders uh, in, from, the, from the periodicity or per disturbance of periodicity in sleeping patterns. So I, I guess that by analyzing, for example, the sleeping patterns of the humans and the activities, one could guess from these models. If it's a child or if it's an adult or if it's a female or male, but uh, at the time, during these projects, we, we did not really uh, we did not really try to extract such patterns from that. Uh, the same viewer, uh, Miss Turner, uh, also asked about the the potential of the use of this technology in in, in military situations, um, and where there could be war spaces, which are indeed also public spaces. So, and in such in such environments, which are rapidly changing. Uh, there'll be lots of unpredictable, unpredictable situa uh, situations where different human behaviors occur. So there might be a, uh, a part, some of the humans, of course, might be attacking the robots. Some might be trying to flee away. Are there, is there work in place to, to quickly distinguish between um, enemy, and, enemy and friend and, and in, in these rapidly changing or sort of almost violent situations, be able to distinguish that and do it very quickly, real time? Is that possible? So this particular technology is not aimed to deal with these uh, chaotic situations where you have uh, fluctuations of, of rapid dynamics. Uh, however, there is a potential application that, that uh, regards security, and that's anomaly detection. So what you can do if you have a proper temporal model of uh, typical people activities at a particular location, and then you are observing a person doing something that typically does not take place at, at this particular time, you can actually flag this up as, uh, as an anomaly and as a potentially threatening behavior. So in this way, you can detect intruders in buildings and you can detect uh, any kind of, of, I would say, activity that's not a typical activity for that particular time. So we did some, uh, some uh, small investigation of this, of the, of the strength of the tools I was showing to detect anomalous presence of people in, in certain areas. And what we found out that this tool is, is pretty actually efficient in this. And we were coping better than uh, algorithms like Profet, which is an algorithm developed uh, by Facebook for prediction and for anomaly detection. Listening to you speak, actually, and trying to sort of find metaphors in, in, in the own way how we think, how the human brain works. One could imagine that if, we, if you're in a, a war-like scenario where change is so rapid and can be so destructive, then of course there's the, 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 the human phenomenon that our brain, we can go into shock, where all of a sudden we aren't able to cope. So is shock something that can be, is also occurring in, in, in robots? I mean, is that parallel... Does that parallel hold? So the human brain gets shocked, it's unable then to make clear decisions. Does, does the, does the ro robot uh, CPU or brain have a similar effect of shock? 
So I never thought about this, actually. If, if uh, I mean, defining shock as the inability to cope with the surrounding uh, with the surrounding situation in an efficient way. Uh, I would say that this actually happens to robots a lot, and this is because they did not, they don't have a, a long experience of uh, these chaotic situations. So either you tailor you tailor your robots to cope with these situations, yeah. and then you are able to handle this specific situation that the robot is is designed for. But if you deploy the robot to a new environment with uh, different dynamics, then the robot is going to do yes something stupid or it's going to to do something that was trained because, for originally because i think the, the 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 fundamental sort of algorithm or the mathematics the physics has to be very similar because in to train you can train the human brain against shock and that's done by simulating certain um, experiences a number of times until the brain is able to cope with that sensory overload sufficiently that it can still operate under that stress. So I was wondering if, if, if similar sort of work had been attempted with, uh, with robots. But let, let's move on, because there are other questions, and, and time is running short. Um, there's another question about, you did mention you had a, a, a short film of how um, humans can help build up these um, uh, uh, spatial temporal maps using their, their mobile telephones to help predict um, the, the flux, the flow of people in certain areas. So there's a question related to that. Uh, has this predictable technology, or uh, technology that can enable predictions, on people density been already used in the current COVID conditions? So actually, this tool was tailored for this, uh, for this, uh, for this situation. And we started, uh, when this situation happened or on March, we were thinking, okay, how as roboticists we can actually help the society to cope with this uh, with this crisis? And of course, many roboticists resorted to robots that would do disinfection, that would interact with with patients, uh, that would be able to be deployed at hospitals. But our thoughts were, okay, now you will have a big demand for hardware, and all the supply chains for building robots are going to be disrupted. So we actually created this app, and this app is, is released, and it can be used by general public in Czech Republic. I am not really sure if it's uh, released in the UK, but you can definitely download it from our pages and, and, and try to use it. One of the problems of this app currently is that to perform the forecasts, you need data. And we were particularly successful to convince our friends and supporters in Prague and in, in some small cities around Prague to collect this data for us. So these locations now have these forecasts. However, if I look at the, at the map of England, we have uh, some locations where people provide us, uh, us with data. So I know this tool was, uh, was tested in, in Cambridge, Manchester, Lincoln, and in London. However, the data are uh, too sparse to provide, to cover, a, 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 I would say, a significant number of shops and other public locations. However, we are trying to extend this tool in order to be able to cover areas which don't contain data. And this should work in a way that, imagine that you have a, a certain shop in a certain small town, and you have the data from there, and then you have a town with a similar layout, and a, with, with a similar uh, um, societal composition, the people of the same age, and perhaps it's a time with a similar industry, and the shop is located in, in a similar area in the town. So you can expect this shop to be busy in a similar way as the shop for which you have data. So we will try to embed this concept in this, uh, in this app, and once we are done with this, we'll be able to, to cover a higher number of locations and, and to make this tool really efficient for, for the public. Well, there is one thing about this tool that I wanted to say, and uh, unlike all other tools, this models locations. This models locations and not people. 
So there is no people tracking involved. You gather the data only when you click, there is 60 people here and it's very crowded and I am in a public park. Yeah. And only at the time, the data are sent to the server and they are not associated with your phone. This information is immediately thrown away. So unlike all other applications used for COVID or many other applications, this has, this has privacy by design. There is no it's, it's uh, spatial specific information. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Um, moving on, there's another question. It, it might be from a, a potential student or future student, somebody who's interested in studying such technology. And uh, he or she uh, asks, uh, what is in your opinion or which um, institutes or universities, in your opinion, are the most advanced in, in such developments on which you're working or, or the application of the technology that you're working on? Uh, so, the universities that are working, there is not many people actually doing this, uh, these long-term forecasts. It's a relatively new field. But uh, this uh, tool is still being investigated by the University of Lincoln, where it's used in a number of applications apart from social robots. It's, for example, used in precision, in precision agriculture uh, to forecast uh, the yield. Uh, there is also another group in Stanford that are modeling uh, the crowdedness of, of public locations. And there is also some work being done, as far as I know, in University of Örebro in Sweden in, and in uh, University of Sydney in Australia. So these are the groups that we cooperated with on uh, this technology. And these are the groups that I know that are advancing this technology further. Tomashi, maybe one, one, last, one last question. Uh, I'm going to try and I'm going to bend your arm a bit and ask for a, I know that such predictions are obviously very difficult to make, but when do you believe we'll be walking amongst robots? In a real sense, that there'll be a, it'll be a, a completely normal part of our life to, to, to see and interact with them on our daily lives, in the street, not just at home. I'm not, giving, I'm not going to give you a, a, a date or a, a specific time, but I think that this is going to happen when the roboticists are going to join with researchers that know about human behavior. So, so far, there was not much cooperation between roboticists and psychologists. There was not much cooperation between roboticists and sociologists and other researchers that actually understand what makes people less stressed and what makes them anxious about robots and what would allow better acceptance of these uh, artificial beings in the society. So until these uh, social sciences and uh, medicines and technology are not going to be joined together and the researchers are not going to work closely together, we won't see robots being deployed in human environments. Okay. Well, uh, Dr. Tomáš Krajnik, thank you very much indeed. I, I wanted to end on that point about time because this has all been about time, ladies and gentlemen. It's been about that fourth dimension change and how robots can adopt, uh, adapt to change in, regarding their, their movement and their abilities. So um, a big thank you, uh, Tomáš, uh, on behalf of uh, Czech Centres London, uh, on behalf of uh, Czech Technical University, and on behalf of myself uh, and a big thank you as well to all of you uh, at home or at work who have linked in and uh, paid attention and given us an hour of your time I hope it's been useful for all of you who've enjoyed the experience so I wish you all well and I look forward to again meeting some of you in future AI check centers science cafes good night Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you for all the audience. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the organizers who handled this uh, remote presentations very well. And good night. Good night.